He's a multiple Emmy and Peabody winner and has given over 1,200 speeches across six continents. And once upon a time, there was an investment company that used the line, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, the same can be said for my guest today. David Houle is a writer, a thinker, and I'm going to ask him, what is a thinker and a futurist? And we're going to ask about that, too. He spent 20 years working in media and entertainment at NBC, ABC, and CBS, not to mention being on the senior executive team that launched several cable networks. He's described himself as a superficial intellectual grazer. David, welcome to Suncoast People. Happy to be here. So, and it was actually on another show that we're both familiar with, Suncoast View, mm -hmm. about a year ago that you used that phrase, superficial intellectual grazer. What right. is that? Um, so I'm in the business of forecasting the future and trends. So I look for, I have a, several hundred emails coming in every day that I don't possibly read, but I want to see if there's consistency or there's patterns that I can recognize or trends. So there'll be something that'll come in and I, and I, I might just read the subject <clears throat> lines. I go, mm -hmm. okay, this is worth going into. Let me go into that. So, and I subscribe to lots of magazines and, and, and it's just, it, it's to get a wide view. Right. Because most people think about one thing, their profession, their hobbies, certain things they like to read. Right. And my job is to see it all to be able to correctly forecast uh, trends. So, so you're grazing yes. all over the place. And you've won two Emmys. Right. Boy, talk about career shifts. Tell mm -hmm. me about how, uh, let's go to the Emmy Awards because well, I, I got one sitting around somewhere. The, the Emmy Awards were basically in the early 90s. Um, a friend and I came up with the concept. So the early 90s was when teenagers and tweens were getting into gangs. Mm. So we decided to do a show, instead of joining a gang, join a team and participate in sports. So it was called Energy Express, and we had the Clubhouse Kids, and I produced it with Tribune. I was in Chicago at the time, at mm. WGN-TV. Great and, station. And then they syndicated it nationally. And we got lucky because that was right at the time that the FCC mandated or reminded um, broadcast stations that they have to do quality children's television and all the stuff was junk at the time. So we got rapid buy-in. We were in 80% of the country. Mm. It was syndicated for two years uh, and then Tribune did not pick it up even though we won two Emmys. Um, but the whole concept, I mean, we had like Michael Jordan's trainer. We had... Uh, uh, Jim Harbaugh, who was now the coach, he was the backup quarterback for the Bears, and he talk, I, I did that because he's how to throw a spiral, uh -huh. and, and it was just great. So it was really, it was a nice ride. How do you go from being a uh, executive producer of basically a kids show to being a futurist? That seems like another leap. Well, um, so I, you mentioned I had 20 years of, of uh, broadcast experience and cable experience. And that started it. I, I always have done things that people said were stupid or wouldn't work. So, for example, I was at CBS in 1980 when CBS was the Tiffany of the networks, number one. Um, I owned the, the big list. I owned the nightly news back when the local nightly news was getting a 22 rating and a 33 share. Mm -hmm. And I took a 50% pay cut because I knew I could come back and do this and I was bored doing it and I was a success doing it. I took a 50% pay cut to go join the 25 to 30 people at the time who were planning to launch MTV. So again, a trend guy, MTV, music video, what's that? And I said, you know, looking back from 1980 to 1960, again, trends fueling it, what were the two most dominant things in popular culture between 1960 and 1980? rock and roll and television. So how could this, mess? that's not gonna work. What do you mean video, video yeah. music, right? We also then launched Nickelodeon, the first channel for kids, VH1, 
um, a, a, an older demo music, and then CNN headline news. Mm -hmm. Who's going to watch 24-hour news? Right. So, and then in the late 90s, uh, after the CNN, after the uh, Energy Express, I was managing director of a dot com that was the first company to do um, online courses. Oh, that'll never work. So it wasn't until this century that I realized, oh, I've been right about things and that people said wouldn't work and they worked. So, and I've read all the great futurists and I read a lot of science fiction in, in, in my youth. So why not become a futurist? And so that was back in 2005. Um, but so it really was um, it was a progression of realizations. And I had I had done other things after I did the um, uh, Energy Express, where I put together a consortium of 10 network advertisers to fund network programming. I mean, I had AT&T and Coca-Cola and McDonald's, and that's how I won the Peabody. So, so it, it was doing things that were different. That's how I became a futurist. I'm fascinated by the term thinker. Okay. Don't we all think? Yeah, but um, I think about things, I think about what's going to be, where we're going, how to get there, what's going to work, what's not going to work. And most people think about their lives. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote my first book, The Shift Age, um, I realized I didn't had done any market research, right? So I asked about 50 people on a one-on-one -on -one situation like this so people wouldn't be concerned about what they would say in answer to me. I go, so what do you think about the future? And there were three buckets of answers. Uh, one was... Oh, um, I don't know. I, re I, I really don't think about it. I'm really caught up in my life, you know, mm. and, and, and uh, I'm preoccupied. Second group was, oh, you mean my plans? Oh, I want to tell you my plans? Oh, I want to become a manager and I want to go buy a house in the suburbs. So uh, I don't think about it. It's all about my plans. It's personal. Or the third, which was the biggest bucket, I don't really think about it at all. <clears throat> so I realized, okay, you know. If you don't think about it, you should. If you think the future is personal, it's not. And if you're too caught up in life, you really need to take a step back and see where you're going. <clears throat> you're, are you familiar with the marshmallow test? Yes, the one marsh, the two marshmallow the, the, tests. Yeah, the right. short term, long term. Yeah, America is a one marshmallow country, no question. <laughs> right? Yeah. I want it now. It is. A, very quickly, do you, do you want to tell the, the Go ahead. <clears throat> that some psychologists uh, did a um, did a test with with some very small kids, and they they went into a room with a group of small kids and gave each a marshmallow, saying, uh, "Here's a marshmallow for you. If you don't eat the mar, I have to go into another room." If you don't eat the marshmallow, I'll give you a second marshmallow. When I come right? back, right? And when I come back, well, guess what? I think it was all but one of the kids ate their marshmallows. It was some statistic like that. The vast majority of the kids were eating. But the key point of that research was they tracked those that ate one marshmallow and those that waited got to eat two. And the ones that waited and got to eat two had much more successful lives because they were long-term thinkers. Because they yes. weren't immediate gratification. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've written a, I have wrote a column on Medium. The United States is a, is a one marshmallow country. See, I would have eaten my, my marshmallow and taken the marshmallow from the kid next day. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, you've talked about having a vision as you talk about the future. What's the difference between a futurist and a visionary? It's a good question. Because there are a lot of CEOs who are considered visionaries. They're visionaries because their PR firm tells them, tells the world that's what they are. <laughs> uh, a, a visionary is somebody who sees something that doesn't exist and says, why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. A futurist is somebody who says, this is the direction we're going. There's a, there's a big overlap. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, people have called me a visionary, mm -hmm. and, but I don't know if the CEOs who have been called visionaries have been called futurists. Uh -huh. You know, like Steve Jobs was a visionary, yes. right? But he, but, um, and this is an interesting thing. Um, I, I do presentations and I say, 
innovation is an out-of-date word, don't use it. Anybody who uses innovation is a 90s word. In a time of disruption and transformation, innovation is only iterative. So like Steve Jobs is a visionary. If he was a, if he was a uh, um, innovator, instead of getting the iPhone, we would have gotten a Blackberry with a bigger screen. That would have been an innovation. He came up with a whole new thing. He was a visionary. He came up with an entirely new device. Mm -hmm. And his gift, as, as everybody has said about him, is he understood what we wanted so that when we saw it, we wanted it. Wow. So that, he's a visionary. He, he manifested the future and he created the future. But he wasn't a futurist saying, this is what th the world's going to be moving towards. Mm -hmm. Although one could argue that certainly with the, the development of the, the Macintosh computer and... He created and so the future. That, that he, right. he did, he did but, 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 but he didn't... But, okay, I, I see, but, but, I understand. But, but yeah. the, great, the great Alvin Toffler in the third wave in, wrote in 1981 the vision that there would be people all around the United States working from home on computers. Right. That's what a visionary does. And, I, mean, I mean, that's what a futurist did. And he did that, and then Jobs took that vision and created the product for it. Shifting gears slightly, you wrote a book about education mm -hmm. and about the future of education. Right, K through 12. In, in K through 12. We're in a, especially here locally, in a whole lot of turmoil, mm -hmm. both in our region and statewide with K through 12 education. Mm -hmm. What is missing from that conversation? The outcomes for the kids. Simple. If, if a curriculum for K through 12 is based on the current power base's politics or a certain religion's morality, it's going to limit the conversation. You're not, I mean, you can, the education. You asked what a thinker was. Um, K through 12 is about ready with artificial intelligence to go through a transformation uh, wh which where we're going to create thinkers rather than create people who've successfully memorized. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I, I don't put bumper stickers in my car. Um, I have one in my car that says I read banned books. Um, what, the thing that got me in the gut was the beginning of the school semester last fall in the state of Florida. And I read this thing, you know, uh, superficial grazer, I happen to see this, Kiwanis denied donation. So I said, what is this? Evidently the Kiwanis clubs, I don't know if it's of America or Florida, raise funds to give public schools free dictionaries. What an exemplary thing. Small thing, but it's really to a point, yeah. right? And the state of Florida said, that's not allowed. We get to determine what books go in. So one, free, was rejected, and dictionaries must be dangerous. They have bad words in it. You cannot expect the kids who go through that education process to be as good as kids elsewhere where there's no banned books and dictionaries are free. I mean, I mean, it, right? You're so, right. You're right. So You're absolutely I, right. And, and I mentioned to you before we started, I've written some columns and, and, and people are just, uh, on the K through 12, they're just aghast at what has happened with the school board meetings in, the, in, in Sarasota. It's, it's all political. I mean, it, 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 it smacks of totalitarianism in terms of we're going to dictate what we think is right politically and morally for kids who are, you know, virgin territory, yeah. right? In terms of their minds. Yeah. Let's have some fun for a moment. Sure. I want to play a little round robin. I'm having fun right now. Oh, I'm having a great time too. Okay. I was just thinking maybe something slightly lighter. Okay. Because this is this is a heavy mm -hmm. this is a heavy topic, and mm -hmm. I would love to have you back on mm -hmm. to talk more about it, um, maybe in a slightly different forum. But let's play a little round robin sure. on, on futurism. Um, electric cars, big, huge. How Could big? Be, um, by the end of by by 
January 1st, 2030, in the United States, 30 to 50 percent of all cars and all vehicles in a road will be uh, EVs. And you base this on data and projections and growth. Um, air travel. That's it for EVs? Okay, air yeah, travel. Yeah, yeah, no, because we're going to do a little okay, round robin okay. here. I wanna, air I'm air gonna, travel, what about? What about it? Do you, do you see people flying more or do you see it becoming so prohibitively expensive that people are not going to want to to travel by air anymore? I mean, I think that's an economic question. Um, I think people will want to, <clears throat> all indications are more people are wanting to fly more often. <clears throat> the airlines have a huge problem, obviously, this year when all these near collisions and, and stuff, you know, kind of COVID residual stuff in the air and combative stuff. Um, so the airlines are in a moment of crisis right now. Um, what I'm interested in is the long-term aspect. You mentioned EVs, right? Well, right now there are planes that are flying with batteries for up to 250 miles. So I think it's 70% of all flights in the United States are 500 miles or less. So at some point in time in this decade, there will be battery technology as such that you can fly for 500 miles on, a, on, a, on an electric plane. And so that, so, at the same time that the, that, the inter, that the industry is going through an economic upheaval, they're going to be going through a complete rebuild um, uh, environmentally and energy-wise. Speaking of energy, uh, solar and homes turning away from the grid. Um, well, in the last 15 years, solar has gone from 1% of total um, gen or energy generation in the world to 11 percent. So it's, it's going, it's ramping up. Um, and the, the smallest percentage of that is on the homes, you know, in, in the rooftops. It, it, it's the big grid farms and, and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. So, so um, off the grid is a nice idealistic phrase that's going to be hard to reach because Again, whenever you bring about, whenever there's massive change, it's resisted by the concepts in place, by the people who have a vested interest in keeping the current model in place, and very few uh, people who are innovative enough who have the power to come up against that. So off the grid means that utilities will go away because they are the grid, and they're not going to go away. And so it's a matter of how much you're off the grid and, and, and what percent of your energy consumption comes from clean energy. That's the real metric. On that note, we're going to take a pause. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more with futurist David Houle. And we're going to talk maybe a little bit about the future of Florida. We'll be right back. Thank you for watching and supporting Suncoast People. And if you like what we're doing, please make sure to follow and subscribe. If you're feeling generous, consider supporting Suncoast People through patron.com forward slash Suncoast People. And we're back with futurist and really smart guy, David Houle. That's a relative term. Well, I'll just say... In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. I'm going to say you're the smartest guy in this room. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, wow. He was ex quick to accept that. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't well, know. I, I mean, know. I had to take you're that, the David. Host. You're right. You know? <laughs> um, the future of Florida. Mm -hmm. where, does, where does the success of the future of Florida lie, do you think? It's up for grabs right now in um, 2023. Since 2015, I've been saying, and I spoke at the Realtors Association for the County in 2016 when I started the SpaceshipEarth.org, you know, for example, sea level rise, right? So the, the real estate is going to be turned upside down in the state of Florida. 
because the most expensive real estate is beachfront property. So by 2040, most of the beaches will be gone. So it'll be beachless front property, right? So how do you deal with the fact that the most expensive real estate today by the late 2030s will be the most discounted and dropping in rapid price. So um, I spoke right before one of the last in person presentations I did before COVID was to the Florida Association of County and City Managers. So this is Daytona Beach. And I took a big risk. I mean, these are guys who run counties, right and cities. And I said, I want to ask this room a question because you're on the ground. I said, um, raise your hands if you think the following is a true statement that by the mid 2030s, the most accelerating, the most accelerating price increases in the state of Florida will be in the middle of the state. And every, I'd say 70 to 80 percent of the hands went up, hmm. meaning sea level rise is an issue. And what did Hurricane Ian show us? You yep. don't own real estate near the beach. No, you rent it. <laughs> you rent it. And and evidently, and I because I rent, I don't I, I've been reading all the research about how property insurance is through the roof here or it's really at risk because of the hurricanes and because of the um, uh, real estate insurance issues in sure. the state. So sure. Florida is going to uh, is going to have Florida is the number one state at risk for climate change in the United States more than any other state. So that's number one. Number two, the current politics are really oppressively um, or oppressive, um, according to all the feedback I get from the columns I write in the Herald Tribune, and. Um, at some point in time, when is enough people? Before COVID, 500 people a day were moving to the state. Post COVID, 1,000. Okay, when does the state fill up, and when does it change what Florida is? Um, I wrote a series of columns about a year ago in the Herald Tribune, and the loose the loose concept was paradise lost. Hmm. For those of us that have been here for a long time in Sarasota, paradise is rapidly going away. There used not to be traffic. There used not to be paid parking. There used not to be high rises going up everywhere. You used to be able to go to the beach and find a parking place. No longer, right? So the analogy I've used, and this is pockets of Florida, is Aspen, Colorado. In the 60s and 70s, it was the number one place for ski bums to go. Sure. And then it got priced out um, the great, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Fear and Loathing, the... Um, the uh, oh, uh, uh, Hunter S. Hunter Thompson. Thompson. Yeah. He ran for mayor of Aspen, wanting to rename it Fat City because of what was going on. He <laughs> lost. But the point was, it got to the point where the ski industry and the restaurants could not find people to work because they were priced out of the market. So what Aspen had to do is it had to build dormitory apartments 20 miles up the road and bus people in. Mm -hmm. I've been talking about that. Sarasota's going in that direction. So there are other places. Miami-Dade's already there. Tampa's already there. Sarasota's quickly getting there, where it's everything that we move here to get away from we're now here because everybody's moving here. Yeah. So that's that's the conundrum for the state. You don't think that people are moving here because this is the freedom state? Oh, a lot of people are. But what is freedom? Freedom is freedom to carry guns, freedom to ban books, freedom to um, um, have unmanaged development. Mm -hmm. That's the freedom. You have freedom from taxes, understood. I mean, that's why people move here. It's one of the reasons I moved here. You know, it, it's like, how much do I save? Yeah. Right? Yeah, so I hear you. I, I, right now, I think it's in the crosshairs as to which way Florida's going to go. Uh, I love the weather. Um, my issue relative to Sarasota is that my father was born here. In 1913, I'm a technically a third-generation Sarasotan, 
because my grandfather moved here from Ontario in around 1900. My father was born in 1913. There was a Houle Street and a Houle Avenue named after my aunts and uncles because they were early in the Recorder of Deeds office and a local mayor. And so um, I came down in the 50s to visit families, 60s to visit families, 70s to visit families. My parents retired here to, Saras to uh, Plymouth Harbor and they retired here and died here in the 90s as being the only child, so I always came. So sure. I've seen it all, and it's really, you know, that the big bridge to the islands happened right around 2000, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all since then. Do you have any predictions for yourself? Uh, in terms of what? What's next for you? What's next for me? Um, I'm writing a, um, I kind of, took the summer off last year because of some things. I just want to take a break and see what my last step journey part would be, chapter, if you will, in my Your future's mountain. career. Because we talk about the second mountain on this show quite a bit. David the second Brooks, mountain, okay. David Brooks' reference to that next big yeah. thing in your life. So the two things I'm doing as a futurist is, one, I am writing a news um, letter on Substack. People can pay for free. Most of the people are paid or founding members because they want to get all my stuff and participate and get free books and join the and, and go mm -hmm. to the virtual book club and 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 mm -hmm. meet with me two times a year. Right. But that's what I'm doing. So it's, so it's a movable feast. Okay. In other words, I can I can sit at a keyboard and have connectivity. And the second thing is to is after COVID and now in 2022, pretty much everybody is coming back to in-person conferences mm -hmm. around the world. Right. Uh, last year was still some virtual, uh, is to do not the 75 speeches a year I was doing, but 10 or 15 a year. So you're going to just back off a little bit, but the one word that I did not hear you say was the R word, retire. No. I mean, I mean you know, so many guys my age retire, if they're attorneys or they're CEOs, and it's like, well, what do I do? And yeah. I've got a brand. I mean, for, for 17 years, I've been a global futurist, and for the last 10, really, truly global. And, and, and so it's a brand. Yeah. And I feel I can add value. And people come to me, and, and my, my job is to provide humanity with ways of understanding where we're going, and and there's no lessening in demand for that. David Hool, thank you so much. Boy, we're all done. Time I'm, flew. I'm so, but it does fly when you're having fun. Right, we, exactly. We, and we've had some fun. Um, would love to have you back on. I know your schedule is such, but. I'll but, find time for you. I'm, I, well, I, be, I believe in I'm supporting deeply, local media. I, I'm, I'm deeply honored by that. Hey, and, my pleasure. And in touch. And we will continue this. I'm grateful for you folks watching. Please uh, remember to subscribe and like on whatever platform. Here are all the platforms right here. Uh, and please subscribe and like. We need to get our numbers up, keep them going. And that way you can also follow and keep track of what's going on. If you know somebody who you would like to have as a guest on Suncoast People, send an email. And again, the email's right here, info at suncoastpeople.com. But in the meantime, I'm Robert Tim, and thanks for watching. <laughs>